prepared for our children. Our ILIV students will be in the chapel this evening as soon as we begin to sing. Certainly, we want to thank you for your giving. Those that give electronically and even with the baskets at each service, they're available. And then to each one of you, your faithfulness to the house of the Lord, to our guests. We're grateful for each one of you that has come. Most of all, we're so thankful that in the middle of this week, we can be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. He is still a God that changes lives. Praise the name of the Lord. It was this Sunday evening, just after 6 o'clock, that our team at Deliverance was able to rejoice as one person was filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues for the very first time. I say that to God be the glory. It was just last night at junior camp that one of our own children, Tony Nicchio, was filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues. Hey, that same God is at heaven view tonight. Why don't we stand together and as we clap our hands, why don't we lift our voice, worship the Lord. God's going to do something great here tonight. His presence is going to fill this atmosphere. Wonderful things are going to happen here today. Praise God. Once again, thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, in just a moment, Brother Ray Byfield's going to come and give us the word here in the sanctuary. It's going to be outstanding. Then we're going to come forward for prayer at the end. Whether you're a part of this church family or you're just guest, a visitor or a guest today, come to the altar with us. When we all come, let's believe God for great things. Amen. One more time. Let's just lift our hands. Let's lift our hearts and worship the Lord. And let's believe God for great things today in Jesus' name. Let's lift our voices and give him praise tonight. You're worthy, Jesus. Your love is like radiant diamond, bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfire.
Hallelujah. Let's give him another hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord God, for your presence that is in this place tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, you are worthy of the praise. Glory to your name. It's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We can never take these times for granted. God has allowed us to be here, and I'm thankful to be in the house tonight. I'm glad you all made it through the thunderstorm that's not happening outside. So glad to see everybody here tonight. Um, if you get your Bibles, I just want to give, I want to give honor to Pastor Harold Linder, Sister Linder, thank them for their leadership and their, um, their guiding and their prayers. It is, it is great to have great leaders who are real Christian people. I'm thankful to the Lord for that. If you turn your Bibles to Psalms 119. Psalms 119, we will not read the entire chapter, we'll take a few verses from there, um, and if you had, um, if you also make a place for Psalm 37, verse 23, Psalm 119, verse 133, I didn't tell you that, Psalm chapter 119, verse 133, Psalms 37, 23, to 24, and Joshua chapter 2, verse 18. I'm going to go through a bunch of scriptures tonight. And if you have it, say amen. 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 Psalm 119, 133 through 135. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man. So will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant and teach me thy statutes. Psalms 137, 23 through 24. The steps of a good man or a good woman are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Joshua 2 verse 18. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. I can hear a pin drop on the carpet. What does that have to do with Psalms? <laughs> well, we'll get to that. Hopefully, I need to get to that in a few moments. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and our minds tonight. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, so much for your presence that is in this place. Oh, Lord God, for what you have already done, for what you're about to do. Speak to our hearts, O oh Lord God. Lord Jesus, use me to speak your perfect words, O oh Lord God, through this imperfect vessel, Lord God of clay. In the name of Jesus, O oh Lord God, we need your power. We need your spirit tonight, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> the psalmist talks about ordering thy steps, walking. We walk with the Lord. In the natural, every day in our natural lives, we walk, for the most part, we do well. Every once in a while, we stumble or trip over something or even someone. That usually happens when we lose our focus because we have not been paying attention. If we constantly stumble because we are not paying attention, then that becomes a problem. But when we stumble, we right ourselves and sharpen our focus and keep walking. Staying on the ground after we stumble and fall is really not an option unless we have just given up. There are two reasons that we need for our steps to be ordered by the Lord. The first reason is for our own salvation. The psalmist David asked the Lord to order his steps in his word. 
But there will come times when we do slip and we do fall. But we will not be utterly cast down because the Lord will lift us up. God knows that at times we will stumble. I'll say it again. God knows that at times we will stumble. He knows that there are times when we will make mistakes. It's inevitable. It's just like when you're walking down the sidewalk. And sometimes, most, for the most part, you see where you're going. But every once in a while, there's a little bump in the sidewalk, a little raise in the, in the sidewalk, and you stumble over that because you didn't see it coming. And there are other times when on a carp, maybe on a carpeted floor like this, you can't see where the floor is uneven and you fall. But what happens is we get back up because those are stumbles that we didn't intend to make. Those are things that we didn't want to happen to us. So it's inevitable that we will, be, we will stumble and make mistakes, but we will not be utterly cast down. God will help us up and cast and help us to regain our focus in him. David's prayer said, order my steps in your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. That's important to remember. There is a lifestyle of difference between slipping and falling when walking by faith and in obedience to, to the word of God, as opposed to slipping and falling and surrendering to sin and living in unrighteousness. There's a big difference between slipping and falling and just giving up and saying that that's it, it's over, I can't get back up, I can't do it. We are all here tonight, although we have made mistakes and sinned against God. Thank God. There are many that would be here, but unfortunately, you could probably think of names and people who are not here tonight who should be here, but because at one time or another they slipped and fell, and they are still down. They're still, unfortunately, the fall in iniquity has gotten a hold of them. They have allowed sin to take dominion over their lives, but that does not have to be a permanent condition, because whenever they draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to them and bring them out before it's too late. The Bible talks about in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, a very intriguing verse in the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 11, it says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And if I have mentioned that the title of this lesson tonight is Order My Steps. Probably seen it already. The word of God in Revelation 22, 11 seems to be warning us that whatever state that we are in or whatever we are practicing when Jesus comes will seal our fate. We need God to order our steps. We don't have time to waste. In the beginning of Psalm chapter 119, this long chapter, verses 1 through 7, David started off by saying this, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed, focused on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. David understood that keeping his eyes focused on the Lord would keep him walking in the steps of the Lord, would keep his steps ordered by the Lord. Again, Revelation says, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Because our steps need to be ordered in his word. In Psalm chapter 23, verse 3, verses 1 through 3, the word says, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Then when you go down to verse 24, he says, 
You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. The Lord wants to order our steps. He wants to guide us with his counsel because one day he wants to receive us to him. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we will help each other walk in the light. We need to walk in the light. Because God wants to receive us. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man. But its end is the way of death. Order my steps, Lord. Order our steps, Lord. We need to walk in the steps of the Lord. Oftentimes we, we've heard it taught and preached about the children of Israel in the wilderness. Their steps were being ordered by the Lord at first. They're an example of what happens when our steps are ordered by God. Are ordered by God and when our steps are not being ordered by God. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. Now all these things happen to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that I want you to look back. If you read this chapter, he goes through a litany of things that the children of Israel did that brought them out of favor with God. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here, I want you to pay attention. I want you to go back and read. I want you to go back and look at what the children of Israel did. I want you to use that as an example of what to do and what not to do. Because the end, we are living in the end time. He said, for upon whom the ends of the ages have come, that is us. And so he's reminding us to go back and look and use their examples. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, the, the apostle Paul said, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. When the children of Israel called upon God because they needed him, and put their trust in him while they were crossing the Red Sea. He ordered their steps, delivering them from the enemy. When God was ordering their steps, he created a wall of fire between them and the Egyptians. He parted the Red Sea and gave them dry land to walk on. They watched as the Egyptians were, as the, the Egyptians were pursuing them, they were drowned in the sea behind them as God closed the water over their enemy, all because their steps were being ordered by the Lord. For the children of Israel, that salvation experience, and that's what it was, he was saving them from their enemies. That salvation experience should have been enough evidence of God's great deliverance for them to always want to follow them follow Jesus or follow the Lord. Because after they saw that, what else could you ask for? That was a great miracle. God saved them from their oppressors. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough for them. And because you see, salvation is the beginning of our walk with God. When God saves us by the fire of the Holy Ghost, evidence speaking with tongues, and baptism in his name, there are many more blessings that God has for us through his covenant relationship, a covenant relationship that he wants us to have with him throughout our lives. But in order for us to receive what he has for us, we need to follow him. We need him to order our steps. When God brought the children of Israel to the land of Canaan that he was going to give them, he was about to drive out their enemies before them. They were about to receive joy. They were about to receive peace. They were about to receive provision. They were about to get power and protection like never before 
was going to be theirs. God was about to give them their own land. But when they got there, they doubted the Lord. And they, their steps were halted. And because of that, their, because of their, their unbelief prevented them from receiving his perfect will for their life. Joshua and Caleb tried to convince them because 10, 12 spies were sent out. 10 came back with a bad report. Two of them came back with a good report saying that we can take the land now. Those two were Joshua and Caleb. And in Numbers chapter 14, verse 8, this is what, this is how they implored the people. They tried to convince the people by saying, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are, they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. They were trying to tell them, folks, don't give up now. Don't stop allowing your steps to be ordered by the Lord now. It's not, it's, a, don't, it's not too late. God is about to bring us into a land that he's about to give to us. Don't give up now. Don't sin against the Lord now by giving up. But they did not heed the call. They rebelled against God's promise for them. And only two, and those two spies that came back, Joshua and Caleb, they came back with that positive report. See, if God had delivered them from the Egyptians in the Red Sea, why wouldn't he be able to deliver them from the hand of their enemies? God saved us by his miraculous power. Why do we think that the obstacles that we are facing in our lives right now are too big for him to defeat? You see, when we doubt God and when we have disbelief in him, when we don't allow him to order our steps, when we don't walk in his precepts and allow him to teach us his statues, what we're doing is actually showing a lack of faith. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And if we're not pleasing God, we're sinning against God. God was not pleased with their lack of faith. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. This is a trip that was, would have taken 11 days. 11 days. It took them 40 years because of their unbelief, because of their lack of obedience to God, because of their lack of faith. That is what God, can, that's what God thinks about when we do those things to him. There is unfortunately a penalty and a price to pay. I can look back over in my life and think about times when I, didn't, or when I didn't allow God to order my steps in his word. And I look back and it's wasted time. Time that I cannot get back. Wasted time. But I thank God for his, I thank God for his grace. I thank God that even though when I was tripping up and not paying attention to him. He still had his eyes on me. And even though they sinned against God, and even though he directed their steps into the wilderness, he still loved them. I don't want anyone to walk away from here tonight thinking that God doesn't love me. God loves you. God loves us. Even in their sin, our merciful God would help them. Whenever we slip and fall, God still loves us. He just wants us to get back up so that he can order our steps. And the sooner we get back up, the better off we will be. But because of their unbelief, they were unable to move forward into the promises of God. When rebellion and lack of faith and disobedience was put away from them, they, then he was able to trust them. Then he was able to bring them into the promised land. And when I say put away from them, there were elders among them. There were people among them that... God had to, they died in the wilderness. They never made it into the promised land. And when all of that disobedience was gone, when all of that, all of that lack of faith was gone, then God said, now you're ready to go. The problem with lack of faith and disobedience is not only is it sin, but God does not communicate with us in these languages. He doesn't speak to us 
in that way. All things are possible with him. You see, God doesn't speak not being able to do this or not being able to do that. God doesn't speak that language. It's as if he closes his ears to us until we have come to a place of faith and obedience to him. The good news about that is that as soon as we do that, his ears automatically open to us again. But if we walk around saying, God, I don't know if I can. I don't know if you will. I don't know what's going to happen in this situation. I just, I just don't know. I don't know. It's like God is saying, I, I, don't, I can't. I can't. I, that's not possible. There, there's nothing that's impossible with me. That there's nothing at all that is impossible with me. I, I remember one night I, I, I left here and I was, I was, I went back to my apartment. I walked back in the house and I was contemplating something and I, and I said to the Lord, I, I can't do that. I, I don't know. I was, I was showing doubt to the Lord and right away, instantly, I'll remember this until forever. Instantly, the Lord replied back to me. He said, stop saying that. I felt that in my heart. He said, stop saying that. Because we cannot voice doubt and expect God to do for us the things that he wants us to do for, him, for us. Do you know that when God saves us, it's, the only, it's only after we have come to a, a place of faith, repentance, and obedience to his word? Do you know that he can't help the sinner unless the sinner repents? Unless the sinner obeys his word? Unless the sinner shows faith in him? That's why we're here tonight. So, but that continues out on throughout our lives. That whenever we come up against an obstacle, whenever we need God, we need to walk by faith at all times. Now, when the children of Israel finally got to the promised land, got to the point where they were ready to go into the promised land, God gave them the victory. Here's the deal. Whenever we find ourselves going in circles and confused our walk, in our walk with God, something is wrong. We're either disobeying him or not putting our trust in him. The children of Israel sinned against God when they disobeyed and had lack of faith in him. And so do we when we find ourselves confused, when we find ourselves not understanding, just going around in circles. Because God is not the author of confusion. He wants to order our steps. Yes, God fed them in the wilderness. Yes, God gave them water to drink. Yes, God gave them victory against their enemies in the wilderness when they remembered to trust in him. But he did all of this because he loves his people. And what he tries to do to us is love us back to a place of faith. Love us back to a place of repentance. Love us back to a place of obedience to him. That's what God is doing even when we trip and even when we fall. And if you find yourself in a place where it just nothing seems to be making sense, just say, God, I may not understand, but I'm trusting you. Lord, I may not understand, but I'm having faith in you. He's trying to love us. Love us back to a place of covenant relationship with him. God will still bless us even when we are out of fellowship with him. His mercy is so great. He will still love us. He doesn't give up on us. Matthew 5, 45 says, For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and, send rains, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God is good to everyone. He blesses everyone. There are a lot of wealthy people in this world today that are not saved. What they have is the blessings of God. God will bless. He loves mankind. And it made sense to me the other day when I heard someone say that, you know, what, when, the, when the psalmist said, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou considerest him, and if, whenever you get into your prayer, sometimes you just feel so unworthy. You feel, God, why do you love me? Why do you hear me? Why do you answer my call? Why do you listen to me? And someone said something that made sense to me. Said, they said that because his DNA is inside of us. His breath is inside of us. We he created us. We are his people. And so when he looks down at us, he sees us. He says, that's my DNA inside of them. They were created in my image. That's, that's the people I love. Yeah. 
We are the crowning achievement of his creation. And he loves us and will not give us on us. Don't let unbelief and lack of faith get a hold of your heart. Yes, we can still be faithful to church and even faithful in our giving. And he will still provide for us and bless us. He will give us every opportunity, though, to turn to him again. But we cannot wait until it's too late. Because the generation of those that did not believe God could bring them into, could not bring, they, didn't, they were not able to make it into the promised land because of their unbelief. Their steps weren't ordered by God because iniquity filled their heart. What good is all of this if I don't make it into heaven? What good is reading the Bible, coming to church, and, and doing all of this if I don't make it? What good is it if my steps are not being ordered by the Lord? I can come to church. I could sing a song. I could do this. I could do that. But if outside of that, my heart is my steps are not being ordered by the Lord, what good is it? God loves us. He loves his children. But I want him to order my steps. When he orders my steps, I'm not allowing sin to have dominion over me. When he orders my steps, there are struggles that I won't have and battles that I won't have to fight when he orders my steps. I'm not saying it's going to be a bed of roses. I'm not saying that you're going to be riding on a cloud every day. It's not going to happen because there are going to be struggles and problems. But there are some unnecessary things like the, that song said, oh, what grief we go through. I forget the exact word because we don't take our needs to God in prayer. I want to take, I want to walk with God. I want my steps to be ordered with him so I don't go through unnecessary issues and problems and, and go through life just every day I'm turning around. This is bothering me. This is the issue. That's the problem because all because my steps are not ordered by the Lord. When we allow him to order our steps, we will make it to heaven. Here's an incredible fact regarding the wilderness wandering in the children of Israel. And we're coming to that right side of, this, of the picture in a moment. Here's an incredible fact regarding the wilderness wandering the children of Israel. Their enemies were already afraid of them. They doubted God because they were afraid. They had unbelief because they were afraid of the enemy. They were too big. They were too this. They were too that. So God said, into the wilderness you go. As they walked around for that 40 years, their enemies saw and heard about how their God delivered them from the Egyptian. Egyptians. The second reason why we need our steps to be ordered by the Lord, the first one was for our own salvation. The second one is for the salvation of others. Their enemies knew that they, wouldn't, they couldn't win against the God of Israel. Before Joshua led them to take Jericho, this is what the harlot Rahab said to the Israelite spies. The promised land was theirs for their taking. In Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, she said this to the two spies and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on him, on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are, are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon... As we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. The enemies of, of, of the children of Israel were already defeated. Their enemies were already defeated before Israel could go get to them. See, church, the victory is already ours. We just have to stay focused. God will bring us through every trial if we have faith in him and obey his word. Every battle that we win, the enemy becomes more and more afraid. See, the enemy is paying attention to us. 
they're, they're afraid. But the problem sometimes is that we get afraid first. And when we become afraid, then we don't walk the way God wants us to walk. And so they have the victory, or they pretend to have the victory, because they know that the victory already belongs to the Lord. If his people would ever just realize that, hey, we have already won this. We've already done this. God has already done it for us. I'm going to believe on him. Joshua chapter 2, going down to verse 12 to 13. Now, therefore, I beg you, she continues to say, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness in my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father and my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. She had been waiting for the children of Israel to get to her. There are people that are waiting for us to bring the gospel of deliverance to them. And when our steps are not ordered by the Lord, when we have lack of faith or we don't walk in obedience, we can't get to them. Because it's not until we can focus on the Lord that he takes us to them. I believe that Rahab and her family were ready and waiting for their, their salvation. She didn't want to live in the condition she was living in, but she didn't know any better. All the time she was looking over the wall and she was hearing the reports of the children of Israel and that the battles that the Lord was fighting to them and she was waving, she was saying, over here, please come get me out of this situation. I don't like this life that I'm living. I need someone, I need you to come and get me. She was waiting for them while they were taking their times walking in the wilderness for 40 years, going in circles. There were people there that were waiting for them. They need, there are people that can't get to us. The only way for them to be saved is for us to get to them. It's as if there's a great gulf in between us and them. And until we can get to them and bring them the gospel, they cannot be saved. That's the same thing that happened with Rahab. I, want, I need to hurry. She heard about the great things that God had done for his people. And I just want to throw something in here because the two spies went and they lodged with Rahab, who is a prostitute, who is, who is a harlot, as, as, as the Bible says. But in doing, my, in doing the research and doing the studies, in those days, it, it's most likely that she had an inn, that she, had, she was also an innkeeper. They lodged in her house, and this is where people from out of town would come, and spies would even gather. And so when the king heard that they were at where she was, and not saying, the Bible does call her a prostitute, it does call her a harlot. So it means that besides having a nice little hotel there for spies and nefarious people to come in, she was also running another business there. Just want to say that. I don't want to scrub the word and scrub out the meaning of what's going on here. So when the spies got to Jericho, she hid them. And that's where they would naturally, that's where they would go to listen, to hear. They were spies, so they were going to check out the land, hear the people, hear what people had to say. And when they came back, so when they came, she gave them, she told, they had that conversation. But when they came back to, to take the city, then the instructions that they gave, the spies gave to her was this. Joshua 2, verse 18. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you will gather into your house your father and your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. They told her, everybody needs to be in the house. Because if they're not in the house, more than likely, they're going to get killed. That's going to be on you. If they're in the house and they get killed, that's, that'll be on us. Go outside and you will die. Stay inside and your family will be saved. Stay in the church. Stay in the church. You are who God is going to save your family through. You start going outside, it's a good possibility they're not going to make it. Stay in the church. She hung a scarlet cord 
from the window so that the Israelite army would protect her house when they came. The scarlet cord wasn't mere coincidence. There are no coincidences in the Bible. Rahab was a prostitute. A scarlet was a representation of sin at that time, one, one of her representation. But best of all, it also represented the atoning, redemptive power of God. And because of her faith in God, she is in the lineage of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Because Rahab had faith for her and her household. You could read that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Matthew, I mean, Rahab and her family were saved because she had faith. She was ready to change her lifestyle. She gave her life. She was ready to get out of the life that she was living in through repentance. And she was obedient to the instructions of the spies when they told her to stay put, stay in the house. Because when you stay in the church, you stay saved. We are heirs and join heirs with Jesus because we are covered by his blood. Stay in the house. Stay in the house. And let God stay under the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. Through our faith in him and obedience in his word. We will be saved. Almost coming to a close. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 31. Rahab makes it into the hall of, of, of faith. By faith the hall of Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Don't be distracted folks. That's what the enemy wants to, you, wants to do. He wants to distract us from having our steps ordered by the Lord. He wants to distract us through entertainment, through politics, through social upheaval, through a worldwide pandemic, through disagreements of all sorts. This is what the enemy wants to do. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, the, the Lord says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May our faith and obedience go beyond these walls. The enemy will have us right where he wants us. If when we leave here, we focus on the things and the problems that are happening in this world. All the enemy has to say, all the devil has to say to his minions is, that's all right. I don't care if they go to church and get a blessing. As long as when they go back through those doors, we can distract them. But let me tell you something. But if and when they focus on God ordering their steps, we're in trouble. If when they go back through those doors, they can remember to allow God to order their steps. We're in trouble because that means their own salvation. That means the salvation of others. Distraction leads to confusion, which leads to lack of faith and disobedience. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Order my steps, Lord. And in closing, as the musicians come tonight, through good days and bad days, we need to allow God to order our steps. When we cannot see the road ahead, we need to st be still and know that he is God. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 through 18, as we all stand. The Bible said, blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. And will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruits. God, how could my steps be ordered by you? There are two simple ways that we know that our steps are being ordered by the Lord. When we have faith and when we're walking in obedience to his word. Two simple ways. That's how we know that our steps are being ordered by the Lord. Maybe you don't feel as if you're making any progress. Maybe things are going wrong in your life and you just don't quite understand. Just keep walking by faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And as we make our way to this altar tonight, keep obeying his word. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I want to close tonight with Psalm 119, verse 133 through 135 again. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Order my steps, Lord. 
My salvation depends on it. The salvation of my loved ones, my co-workers, friends depend on my steps being ordered by you. They're waiting. The enemy is already defeated. Don't be afraid. He's already defeated. He's already shaking in his boots. He's already defeated. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. The victory is ours. The city is ours for the taking. Winston-Salem is ours for the taking. My communities are ours for the taking. Taylorsville and Statesville and East Winston, it's ours for the taking. They're all ours for the taking. We just have to trust in the Lord and have faith in him. Somebody is waiting for us. Somebody is waiting for salvation and they can't get to us because we are the only ones that can get to them. Oh God, help us tonight, Lord. Order our steps. Order my steps in your word, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all the strength.
anointed with oil tonight. We want to pray, God, that he would heal you, that he would touch you, whatever need you may have. Let's go before the Lord right now and pray for these names. Lord Jesus, pray for these needs. In the name of Jesus, oh Lord. time. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blessings, oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise and glorify your name. Hallelujah. Don't give up, church. God is more than able. They're going to look at you strange. They're going to look at us strange and say, what do you have that cord hanging out your window for? Um, it's hanging out the window for you. It's hanging out for you because when the Lord comes back, I want him to see it and remember that there's some people that I'm praying for. God, remember the people. Remember our family members. When you come back to destroy this earth, before you do, take a pause and remember my family members and save them, Lord, because I want them to be saved. God bless you in Jesus' name. I think it's right at 8 o'clock, 7.59. Just stay still until 8. Then you'll get your kids. Just kidding. God bless you. Go in Jesus' name.